This is episode 27. And in this episode, we're talking about the return of serve. Number 27, one hockey moment to digress. 27. When I think of 27, I think of Frank Mahovlich. Return of serve. Frank, you know what I think of when I think of 27? Sadly. Famous rock stars who passed away at the age of 27. Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain. I'm missing someone. Anyway, I'll think wow. of it. Tragic, 27. Yeah. 27. Return to serve. I'll speed dial through some of these notes. Second shot of every point. It's only not if there's an ace. With today's equipment, yep. you now hear that the read to turn to serve is number one. One shot because there's so many players with a great serve. Mm. Players with a great serve, there's three positives. They can hit an ace, service winner, or uh, following a good serve, there's a short, weak return. Yeah. The return is the challenge to offset those three positives. Usually in pro tennis, the, s- the serve is the key shot. Not so much in, in junior tennis. The key shot is who hits shorts. Who hits shorts. So it's, it, with the return, it's a matter of nullifying the three positives and, and, and neutralizing, at least starting the point on neutral. Yeah. If I were to say one thing, having a great return starts from the get-go. Day one of lessons. Next time you watch Novak Djokovic, study observe how he gets ready it appears the ready position is of utmost importance to yeah. him actually you know oftentimes we'll call the ready position the nerdy position and he has the nerdy position he's like really organized the ready position the position to be ready i used to say that was the only thing that tennis teaching pros agreed upon no way. but now yeah we'll have to get into that um <sighs> the australian open top of the hour being current serena beats Halep. Watch that. Everyone talks about how great Serena serve is. Her attitude on the return is the same, aggression. Yeah. Richard Williams was sly like a fox. 15 months between the two sisters. Mm-hmm. Venus made her mark before the age of 10, played out in Compton, California. After that, both girls did not play junior tennis. They didn't play one tournament. I saw you put that in there. I wonder what the age was because I, you know, I was, I think, 16. This was in Southern California, and there was a girl that trained with us at the Vic Braden Tennis College. She was sweet, uh, Swedish, and her name was Christina Triska, and she was like number one in the tens, I think, um, in Southern California. And I watched her play Venus, and I didn't really know who Venus was at the time, but I just remember watching, going, "Geez, that girl's ground strokes are good," you know. But she was towering over this little blonde Christina Triska, and she hammered her like zero and one. And then I think shortly after that, they were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. First time I. Um, was in tune with the Williams sisters that they sent a, a, a video to, to Vic, which we, we have a copy yeah. of. But then I was the director of tennis at Seguzo Bassett, which is now Chris Severance. And Rick Macy at the time, he wanted to merge with Seguzo Bassett. So I spent a lot of time on the court with, never coached him for a second. I remember you know having Richard watch me make videos. Yeah, But I remember being introduced to Serena Shaking hands with like I was meeting somebody from the NBA. Then he told me, I won't introduce you to Serena. She might bite your finger. Right. I like the Vic tape where he goes, uh, Richard says, you know, you always say we'll be famous by Friday, but your tapes are so good. You know what? We got good by Tuesday. But why I say it was just lie like a fox is they didn't play push ball tennis. They didn't, you know, they. Yeah. Um, I used to say that when they first came on the scene, they were making tennis like home run derby. They were teeing off on everything. Mm. Um, you know, home run derbies and baseball were trying to knock the ball out of the park. But when the point's over, you have to ask yourself if you're playing aggressive percentage tennis. Mm-hmm. Um, let me uh, say this. When I ran an academic program for tennis teachers, I used to staple four blank pieces of paper together, and, and it was a test. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think back of all the different teachers I had. You know it's a, it's a tough class when you just you just go in and you just ask one question. <laughs> but this is just a lab assignment, rainy day. And, you know, take the next two hours and then um, write write information down on the return of serve. Now we've all had English teachers that have told us write the outline first, and but we all I think have had have written the paper as a kid and then went back and wrote the outline. Yeah, yeah after right, after exactly. you wrote the paper. Here's what I wrote. So. 
I just put down a few a few points from the chapter, but in doing that, tell tell the, the coaches I've trained um, that they should be able to take each segment, each chapter, and then make it an encore or a classroom presentation. Right. Well, along those lines, I think parents should know. Uh, just consumer beware. We talk about training coaches with a two-year degree program. Most programs don't have a training program at all. There's no orientation. Yeah. One thing I put down um, is position. Establish your territory. Mm-hmm. There's, there's obviously singles and doubles, but bisect the potential angle of the return. We prefer to tell people to stay close, but then that gets into the, the next part, the, the basics. Yeah. Um, by staying in close, generally, you know, we tell people, okay, like a volley, return like a volley with an added follow through. Mm-hmm. And then once you get used to their pace, you've established the territory that you can, you can stand in close, take the return. But then from there, you just turn like a volley and then you just make the circular motion. The image from an image standpoint, you're just taking the racket right around the beach ball. Mm-hmm. You know, there's singles, there's doubles, there's different surfaces. Uh, playing different styles. I mean, you have to obviously make adjustments when you're playing against the lefty. Um, but the starting position, you know, you see people who stay back, like say Nadal stays so far back, yeah. Dominic team, but they pretty much know that the person on the other side is not coming in. Exactly. You know, Roger Federer, um, we've, and the people that follow these podcasts, um, we've said many things from one podcast to the next because the return of serve is tied into every aspect of the game, basically. Yeah. So Roger said at Wimbledon, when we talked about stats, mm-hmm. he knows that less than 2% of the time his opponents are going to come in. Yeah. Um, they can sp- just chip it back. The split step, split step on the return of serve is actually different than when someone's coming into the net. Even though we teach people land on two feet, we know if someone's right-handed and they're going – for forehand volley, they're going to land on their right foot, which is at a 45 degree angle. It's just so they can have that ground reaction force and push off. But the preceding steps, sometimes they're called pre steps, rhythm steps. It's almost like a sprinter coming out of the blocks. You need small little steps. When we make videos, we count the steps. How many steps, even when they're hitting ground strokes, it's in slow motion. How many adjustment steps do they make? Mm-hmm. Sometimes people actually. You tell that and the, the motive, you try to motivate people. And then times what you do is you over motivate the motivated. Mm-hmm. And then they're expending, too, too, much. expending <laughs> too much energy with their yeah. feet. The pros, it's, it's a fact that they go on statistical cues. You know, the laser focus, they're looking at the toss, you know, right before the contact point, and they make a move. Oh, is it interesting, you know, when I think about the return? Where in Vic Braden studies, Vic, who we talk about every week pretty much, but uh, with the eye mark recorder that studied studied the eye, the pupil, and he was like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, we can see where these people who are really great anticipators for the return, let's see where their eyes are focused. And, you know, the player would say, well, I focus on the my opponent's hips, you know, and get an early read. And then what he found is they're actually looking up in the trees. <laughs> and that it actually was more of the statistical... Um, cues that they were going off of and not not the visual cues that people say. Ili Stasi was looking at the cute girls <laughs> on the co- court side. Basics, activate footwork. But the the ready position, you can watch people now in the ready position, and it's a pretty safe bet. The racket's not centered. Because they, they're hanging onto the racket with a, at least a semi-Western grip. So the racket face yeah. is pointed down, the racket's tilted off to the side. Yeah, And it's a pretty safe bet. They're going to stand way back. You know, I think of uh, Roger Federer versus Andy Roddick. Roddick had a faster serve. It came down to who he, who would hit more aces. People would just say, "Well, you know, Roddick's excuse me, Roger is such a great spot server." But because of the mechanics of most players, you know, they have an extra movement when they they turn. They don't have the racket center. They don't have the racket organized. The ready position is the forehand volley. The ready position is the forehand volley, and it is the re, the backswing for the forehand. Yeah. that what they do when they have a larger swing, they make up for it by taking more time. They stand further back. Exactly. So it's, it's easier for the player to, uh, to to move the returner off court, hit aces. Yeah, I just think that's where the advantage of an eastern grip, where you can make that initial turn, your strings face forward to the oncoming ball. 
And then you can take that short compact swing. Uh, there's a video that I have. It's uh, Leighton Hewitt, and he's returning serve. It's a high-speed film that I have. And I'll never forget this because there's a, a return where he's stretched out a little bit wide. But he goes from his, you know, more extreme grip, and you see him switch to an Eastern, actually, to square the racket up and then bring it through. And uh, I was like, wow, look at that. Why doesn't he just, just wait? It's just easier to switch to the forehand side than it is to go, or sorry, towards the backhand than it is to go the other way. But Yeah, along the same line, do you think of uh, Roger Federer making a unit turn for the forehand and then Rafa Nadal? If it comes down to a drop shot, Roger has more disguise. Yeah. Because he, uh, Rafa has to realign his grip. Yeah. Because he starts with, say, his grip closer to four and Roger's closer to three. Yeah. I always say parents want options and opportunities for their children. You want options on the return to serve. So if you have the clean ready position, like a like um, Novak Djokovic, you turn, and I like uh, use it all the time. The late Bud Collins said Jimmy Connors had the, the great system for stealing the ace. Yeah. Turn like a wall to the ball. I think a lot of this too is it's important for listeners out there. I mean, if if you're a club player. The return to serve <laughs> most of the time or a lot of times you're basically just going to hit your regular forehand or backhand. I mean, when, you know, you're going to have time, you know, or a second serve, especially is just going to be a short ball that you, you could attack and hit a regular forehand or backhand, but at a higher level where the serves coming in faster than to have a simple system like this, you know, where you can turn and have the racket aligned. Oh, today I did a drill with two, two players that are, um, give or take, say there are 12 on the UTR and they're practicing against some players that are, you know, say an eight, nine. Yeah. So I want you to return serve. I want you to end the point in two shots. You can't hit top spin. You know, so they're just going to come in volley with an added follow through. Yeah. So with options or tag turns into tactics, technique turns into tactics. And we're going to go through that in more detail. I'll practice. We need to cover that. So this would be in the outline. Mm -hmm. um, one of our podcasts, we talked about Jim Lair, the rituals, all the things, that uh, his work, his contributions to tennis, his study in, in between point times. I mean, even breathing. Yeah. Um, Jacobson, you're, you're going to hit a plus, a minus, or IP on your return. It's going to be strong, weaker in play. Yeah. You could hit a winner, a plus, plus. It's an unforced there, minus, minus. It can be a minus F. You're also on the return. Minus F was a forced error. Yes, exactly. When it could be, as you just said, it could just be a regular forehand and a regular backhand off the return. Mm -hmm. It could be a it could be a forehand or backhand approach off the return. It could be a forehand or backhand. How this was done on his computer, you just put it as a passing shot. So by just putting um, pushing the return and then pushing P mm -hmm. P A information created information so then just by pushing that button you knew how many times the person was serving volume yeah just by pushing return p yeah um i think also in the return carlos goffey uh what um carlos goffey senior brought to the table with red light yellow light green light um where you know there's not just a green light when you're ahead by two or three more points even when you're behind so the math is on your side to be more aggressive it's just amazing to me that Young kids go years without serving volume, having no pattern play. They go years without taking a second serve and coming in. Yeah, so green light points. I mean, you got the the court where we line that up, the, the green zone, the yellow zone, the red zone, three areas of the red zone. Then you got those green, line, green light points. Chances. Yeah, so the green zone is, you know, from 10 and a half feet in. Green means go. Yeah. You're in the most offensive position if the ball is above the level net. If not... You have the most offensive position, but you sometimes have to play the ball defensively. Opponent awareness. Um, we're going to go through uh, our, the pillars, like say Vic Braden, Dennis Van, or Welby Van Horn. There's others. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Jacobson and Lair. You know, what, what did they have to say about the return to serve? The history, the example, examples. Who are the best and why are they the best? Uh, a term that's so important on the re return is chunking. A chunk of this and a chunk of that. You don't just become a great returner overnight. You have to do so many different things. Um, John Wooden, 
the fundamental. So from day one, you're teaching the ready position, you're teaching the unit turn, you're teaching a short compact swing. Yeah, It's a major ordeal when you're watching a little nine-year-old and they are they got the mentality, the focus, and they're getting every ball back. But say on the forehand, the racket's going four feet behind their back. Yeah, You just, you just know that's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. A train's coming right at the kid. Yeah. Because they, they, then they just become hardwired to have a swing that goes about 270 degrees on a 20 degree court. Yep. A lot of calculation. People need to understand planning for the future. They need with the return. They need to understand little kid tennis versus big kid tennis. Um, the fitness, you know, the athletic ability, the ability to jump, change direction. Um, yeah. So you, it's not a standstill shot. Yeah. Got to get a quick first step. You know, it's like with Agassi saying years ago, well, you take three steps to your right, you take three steps to your left, and then it could come at you at 135 plus. Mm -hmm. He's talking about how to cover San Francisco's serve. Mm -hmm. This is something that's very important on the outline, covering break points. So coming back to just stapling those four pieces of paper, the students are looking at you like, what are you talking about? The return of serve. <laughs> um this the break points that stat is just huge uh, to me it lets you know the competitiveness and competitiveness of a match so your your player could have more break points but they didn't convert yeah and then you know what did they do not to be able to cash in on a, a break point yeah or even the 30 all points you know the deuce points really those pressure points um yeah all the points are important um it's you know, in the end, it's who wins the most points is who wins the last point. You know, you hear people say every game went to deuce. Um, but make them play. Very little tennis played in tennis. You know, Nick Balateri, right back at you, baby. You know, just, yeah. they're, they're serving, you know, attack, counterattack. Where does that term come from? Is the serve's coming in big, the return's got to come back big. You know, and you, and you get your speed from the incoming ball as well. Um. You want to try to hit a plus. Right? You, 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 I remember being reprimanded, a nice guy, Vic Braden. I was working with him one time, and I told a group of students, I said, well, just block the ball back. And he told me, Steve, never say that. Because what you want to do is counter speed with speed. You know, actually, if you just leave a racket still, say if someone's really close to the net, and they get tight, and, it's like, and they don't go forward aggressively, the the steel racket's like a wall. The ball comes in at one angle. Yeah. And it leaves at the same angle and in a downward position, just reflective. The, uh, you got you to scout. You got to plan. You got to know the type of people, the person you're playing against. Yeah. Um, you know, Warren Pretorius, I remember him telling us a story where uh, Djokovic's entourage, a member of the entourage, calls him up and wants to know, you know, where does uh, Papa still serve? Yeah. Uh, but chunking is, uh, again, just like Tom Brady, um, you know, he is uh, very good at reading defenses, the famous football player. You know, how can you read the serve? Tom Brady, he's famous? Yeah, he's famous. The guy, he looks pretty, like me. He's pretty famous. <laughs> Vic Braden, the novice is happy to be alive. <laughs> the experts, um, the chunks all become one and are put in order. They never take their eyes off the ball. They follow the toss. They know something is very important. Some, the return, something very important is about to happen. <laughs> Tunnel vision is one thing. The ball, make the return. The athlete's a biocomputer. The return is sophisticated, specialized software developed by logging thousands and thousands of hours of play. The chunking is the mind, the eyes, the feet, the hands, the body parts, one's attitude, spirit, character, all zeroed in for that three to six millisecond hit. <laughs> um, hiccups in a major match with major players, a hiccup will just cost a match. A junior match is usually a comedy of errors. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of tennis, um, I should say quality tennis, quality tennis comes down to just a few points here and there. Yeah, so the margins are so close. And it's amazing, we'll get back to practice is people don't practice return. Second most important shot, arguably the, the most important. Yeah, I think you know, some of that goes to as well as people just think, well, again, it may be the club level. Well, I'm just hitting a forehand or a backhand. You know, to them, it's not really a, a stroke in itself. And it really, it really isn't until you get to a higher level. 
Where, okay. No, it's like say James Scott Connors. You know, he was very good as a ten-year-old, but no one really knew how good he was until I mean, he's a freshman. He wins at UCLA, yeah. and it's what he could do not so much against first serves, but what he could do against second serves. He would just pound the second serve, and of course, you know, he wasn't the first, but Chrissy and Chrissy Everett and Jimmy came along, and the two-handed re- two-handed backhand just changed the return of serve. Yeah, with um, the ready position. You can almost guess if someone's a competent volleyer based on the ready position. Mm-hmm. Not only how they center the racket, their upper body, but do they um, do they hit? Uh, uh, coach last week, uh, Vasilio helped us with stringing. He said that he did a, a, a clinic with Roger Federer. Mm-hmm. He's hitting with three, five club players. He said he was, was still split stepping every time. Yeah. Uh, if you see someone and they don't have the racket center, it's, you could, it's just a safe bet that that kid plays a swing volley. Right. So if that kid has the, the ready position that's pointing downward, um, you know, I mentioned like a Michael Mo, what a great athlete, but his ready position, he's got some calculations to make. And, um, but with that, I'm not saying that someone at his level needs to change, but if you could turn the clock back, um, it's not that it's wrong, but he has a, more difficult system to calculate on the return of serve. Yeah, I think it is interesting. You, you know, you mentioned, um, I think it was yesterday or recently about, yeah, yesterday we were working with a young girl here that's playing in the 25K tournament. And uh, you were talking about Lendl and the return of serve that, you know, he made some changes in his return, you know, for Wimbledon, the way he aligned the racket for his ground stroke and then his return were, were different. Lendl skipped Wimbledon early on in his career said he was allergic to grasp when he was interviewed, but he was standing out on a golf course when he said that yeah, Lendl awesome. made the change on the return, yeah. but not in the rally. Right. But Lendl was a person he used to, you know, always have to take a second look. I mean, eight U S open finals in a row. He used to actually step back. He was so good from the baseline, step back, let the ball, you know, he wasn't the player that hit the ball on the rise. He, the ball would ascend and when it got to its apex, then it would descend. So when the spin and speed dissipate, come off, you can actually hit more spin. Uh, but, you know, he did change his return to serve. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. my point with that was, you know, you'd have to really take a close look at players to see how they try to return against faster servers. And usually, obviously, they got to make more calculations. They got to scoop back to, to buy time, like you see with a Rafa or Medvedev. You know, they have a little more complicated... Well, and then when they wait that way, they only have the option, that word again, is to hit topspin. Yeah. Now, coming back to take a second look, Jimmy Connors, he didn't wait on the forehand side with his grip on three. And people say that, you know, he, he hit so flat. Well, he could hit topspin. But, he, you know, he, he was a guy who was just hitting lasers. It was, for the most part, he didn't, have, you know, hit shots with high trajectory compared to, to Borg. And that's yeah. what they were, comp- they were obviously comparing him to Borg yeah. early on. They played each other so many times. But Connors, so when he had his, when he turned and his grip was closer to a semi-western than an eastern, his racket face is lined. He's a lefty, but for say right, right-handers like myself, eighty-five percent people the racket and the lefties have to think in a right-handers world. It's un- unfortunate, but so the racket is pointed to the right. Yeah. So Connors would pull it in. Right. So I mean that's where he ended up yeah. having like Kramer had some side spin when he would hit approach shots. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about people playing even a conventional approach volley, that, that's a that's a lost art. Yeah, people are just playing swing volleys, and so if they're if they're only playing swing volleys, they won't have that Bud Collins steely ace line the racket up like a wall to hit the ball uh, flat. You still have to swing up approximately twenty degrees. Yeah. So, um, but it, Jimmy Connors is years of hitting against the backboard, you know, the great returners. Um, but with that, hitting against the backboard, you want to be very efficient, so go slow. We're having some young kids today hit against our backboard with just orange balls. Mm-hmm. You know, orange balls, even two bounces, because they have to become efficient first. Yeah. But then once you're efficient, uh, we have these portable backboards. They, they are very good in many ways, for a beginning player, for even an experienced player, for footwork, hit 40 balls in a minute. Yeah. Excuse me, but when it comes down to hitting against a wall, 
It's like the ball goes to the net and comes right back. Right. And then if you're standing in close and hitting the ball right up the middle and just pounding it. Yeah. So it goes in fast, comes back fast. You got to make all these adjustments with your feet. Yeah. And and with your grip too. Swing's got to be compact. Yeah. Oh, and then when you make this make the study of great tennis players, they all spend endless hours on a backboard. A uh, couple more thoughts on grips. The one-handed player, it's problematic to have two grips. You know, I think of uh, Becker and Edberg sharing the Wimbledon title. A lot of times what players will do, they have a, a grip closer to a continental or a composite yeah. in between a continental and eastern backhand, and they... Angle, the grip determines the angle of the racket face, angle racket face determines the angle of the racket path. Yeah. And they're floating, the, they're, they're chipping their return back. Yeah, they can play it late. With, play late. Um, when you wait with a forehand grip, the racket's centered. If you wait with a backhand grip, it's not. It, it's not like, there, like there's a right or wrong. Uh, I have in my notes, Robbie Seguzo, who I've known since he was 10. He was ranked number one in the world in doubles. He waited with a backhand grip. Um, Braden. Return like a pro shot. The term tabletop means linear. Like you're going to take a racket, the racket right across a tabletop. Some people say, well, that shot doesn't exist anymore. Well, if, if people aren't playing a conventional approach volley, if they're not standing in really close, yeah. um, taking a return and coming in on it, playing an approach shot off the return. Yeah. If a, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and it is still an upward swing. It's just, yeah. like you said, it's, it's shallow. It's you know, 17, 20 degrees. Well, that comes back to establishing your territory, standing in close. And then with that, uh, you just think about having such a compact swing. So you just turn. It's like a volley. Mm -hmm. And then from there, now you're used to the speed of their serve. And now you actually, you, you want to hit topspin. You, know, you, you can hit a more of a tabletop flat return when you're playing singles. You're playing doubles. You got the partner, you got the opponent at the net. It's going to be too much poaching if you're not cranking tops in on your return. Um, well, at least, yeah, yeah, you got to keep it low. I mean, so. Two handed players want to do their very best to hit two handed. At a real high level, when a two handed player has to hit a one handed return, yeah. they're going to generally hit a minus. Right. Now, in today's game, they're not really closing in so much to hit a volley off a high floating return, but they're going to set up for the forehand. And that's where you hear the serve plus one. Right. You know, Dennis Vanner, used to like how he would tell people, he would actually do this. He'd line a student up and then he'd intentionally double fault. And if they're just, if they're, st if they're still standing right there. So you just take the baseline on one side, your service line, the net, the next service line, Baseline. So if you're standing on one baseline, just call that number one. Next mm -hmm. service line, the service line two, the net's three, the other service line's four, and the baseline's five. So be, you know, when, you, you're, when you're hitting your serve and you actually hit intentionally as a coach, you're hitting your serve in the net, they should have already turned. Right. That comes back to chunking. That's how fast do they do that? Yeah. Their recognition skills, their reading skills. Um, Welby Van Horn. Um, taught Charlie Passarell. Charlie Passarell is one of the co-founders of uh, the uh, tournament out at Indian Wells, yeah. and they have Welby's Wall. Yeah, Welby used to have students hit the backboard thirty minutes, um, thirty minutes before their lesson, and then to digress, they would stand in front of his pro shop window. So it was a thirty-minute lesson, but they're there for an hour and a half. Thirty minutes on the backboard, and then they would stand in front of the mirror. Excuse me, in front of the pro shop window for thirty minutes. And those were the days where um, if you didn't shadow swing, he would just kind of whack a few balls at you. Yeah. It reminds me of a story when he asked a couple of kids to go shadow swing in front of the window, and they they did what they were told. They shadow, swing, they shadow swung in front of the window, but they weren't facing the window. Yeah, I called him back in. I said, Mom and Dad, <laughs> your two kids are probably the two dumbest kids I've ever met. <laughs> oh, they're actually both scholars, but... Book smart, street smarts, common sense. Let's talk about Connors, Agassi, and Djokovic. With, um, you know, why why were they great? Um, with Connors, we talked about backboard. 
Ag, uh, Djokovic the backboard with um, Agassi. Great story. Very quickly, the his dad Mike buys a house. They move from Chicago to Las Vegas. Andre's the youngest of four. The realtor wants to go through the front door. Mike walks around back, paces off 120 feet for the length of the court. He goes, "This is it. We'll yeah. take it." That's a man on a mission. And then he, you know, he's hitting 2,500 balls, you know, with a souped-up ball machine. Coming back to the backboard, with the bigger the dream, the bigger the work ethic. I mean, you know, you know, we built a be built a wall, and you, know, you would think kids, all right, I'm going to get down there early and hit on the backboard. You know, 15 minutes is equivalent to an hour of balls hit. I tell kids when they hit a college campus, you need to to do a few things. One is go find if they have squash courts or indoor racquetball courts. Yeah. Where can you hit against a wall? You know, yeah. there's there how many gyms around campus. Is there a place where you can hit the backboard? Yeah. I mean, the bigger the dream, the, the bigger the work ethic needs to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Connors, when he would hit, it would be off a wooden floor. So the ball would come back so fast. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, I was at a uh, Prague facility, uh, the Sparta club where Lendl learned to play. Um, you know, they've, you find this out about a lot of kids from Eastern European countries. Yeah, we had one court, and that, you know, all they could do is hit against the ball, the ball, the backboard all day. Billie yeah. Jean King said that she was capable as a kid just hitting the backboard six hours in a row. Yeah. With, um, yeah, standing too far back. So the the, um, you know, I, I do think that um, the players will spend more time on hard court. You know, that's not, that, that's, you know, Jimmy Connors, an American, Agassi, an American. I also think, you know, on the women's side, like for me, Monica Sellis, and I know she hit against the backboard years and years and years too. She hammered the return. No, that's in my notes that um, Braden has down that, and I don't know if this still stands to this day, but no one, man or woman, took the ball earlier than Sellish. But her father was big teaching hop ball baskets, about 250 balls. So he would serve 500 balls to his daughter from the service line. Yeah. And also to the aggression. I mean, there was times if people could exploit, you know, make her hit a low volley up at the net, dink her a little bit, but it was very difficult because she was just so ferocious. Yeah. Um, but she was dictating. She was dictating. Of course, in women's tennis, um, it may not sound chauvinistic or sexist, but uh, there's... Just so many breaks to serve. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, in, in the analytics, it's that, hey, um, the second serve is is really a, a weakness. The, the returner has the advantage on the second serve. In fact, I was talking to Warren Pretorius about some analytics, you know, with return a little bit, and, and uh, it's one of the things that he mentioned. You know, one, one thing with um, returning, speed training against the wall, it's skill acquisition, so... Um, Mike Agassi, um, his daughter, uh, Tammy, she was at, uh, this two year school I worked at. So I watched her practice for a year. She didn't have the same technical base that Andre had. She went on and played at Texas A&M, but, um, Andre Agassi, I think really out of fatigue, young kid, 2,500 balls. Yeah. Um, you know, he said so many things about Jim Lair. Lair could go on and on with a, different ideas from Jim Lair's. He used to say, would you want to talk to some kids, get them really tired. You know, they're gasping for air. You know, you run some sprints, a great kid. Then you come over and tell them a few things. And you know, the, the thought is that they'll listen more. So, but with Agassi, just fatigue. Fatigue's a great teacher. You get people really tired and all of a sudden they're going to run with less, you know, they're not yeah. going to be shifting their head exactly. and their arms aren't going to be going everywhere. But again, survival. But speed training, skill acquisition. Ideally, um, to have players be taught detailed information so they're not learning through trial and error. Because with trial and error, there's not a guarantee that you're going to become the best tennis player you could be. Well, it takes longer as well. Well, yeah. With Sometimes you find out you have to go backwards. Yeah. But it's kind of like the, the kid who's going to learn to play guitar, they're going to have no lessons and just play until their fingers bleed or the kids can take a guitar lesson and never practice. That was so, me. The, the latter was me. <laughs> <laughs> but so someone, 
um, you know, if you could get kids to just stay inside the baseline, try to hit the ball on the rise, it's mm-hmm. a way to get them without, you know, verbiage, getting them to have short, compact swings. Right. It, so it, it's an attitude, nail the return, nail the backboard. With you got to figure like a Jimmy Connors. I'm sure if uh, Selish's uh, father, it's it's just it's a drill that's as old as the mountains. You serve at people from the service line. Yeah, you you reduce the distance, so then you challenge them. You know, it's like instead of someone serving or in baseball throwing from the pitcher's mound, if all of a sudden they're going to cut that distance in yeah. half, it's going to be a little tougher to hit the baseball. I remember watching uh, Michael Chang while he was coaching. Um, Nishikori, and I think Nishikori was going to be playing Karlovich or Chilich or somebody that had some height, and he was on top of a box doing that drill. You know, just standing up tall and, and cranking serves from closer in. With, um, but the practice, um, the four to one ratio, but but when you go out and have people hitting serves, is Practice serves and returns. Just divide the group in half. It's, you're on this side, you're on that side, and just over and over again, practice the return serve. A lot of times people wait to the end. Um, they wait to the end of practice to hit serves. Yeah. I think also, you know, doing that with, if the players struggle with their serve consistency, that's where you can put them up close as well so they can still work on their motion, but then they can have a better chance to just give the returner some reps as well. And then the returner gets less time and they can work on. Yeah, I think when a, when a teaching pro serves from the service line, they just put their rack in the overhead position and just pump balls very quickly. Yeah. Um, if you're having players, serve players, you're, you're best to have them work on their service motion. Yeah. But you can have a returner and say, for example, you get three people serving and they actually, they're just going to get a ball serve, get a ball, serve, get a ball, serve. And they just one right after the other, one right after the other. Uh, people are, obviously I've coached a lot of lefties and lefties are very popular because people want to practice with them. You know, you just, um, you know, people who end, people, for example, who play doubles, like say there's so many lefty righty com- combinations. That could be a tri- great trivia question. Um, you know, you go Shriver and you're Atalova, you go Roach and Newcomb and, Fleming and Macro, the Bryan brothers. Well, if the lefty's playing, they just figure that they're, the righty's getting to practice with, with the lefty, so it's very good for them. Uh, why don't you talk about Roger's saber? The sneak attack by Roger. Yeah, I mean, talk about a short swing and anticipation, basically taking the return as a half volley, taking time away and then just getting in, you know. It's really kind of a shock play, you know, where all of a sudden, you know, he's up there at the net. And you can draw an error, you know, even if, even if the saber wasn't that great. Well, it's a, it was a shock play a couple of years ago when he started doing it. But if you think back about the old grass, you think of uh, Labor winning in Wimbledon in 62 and 69. And when it rained, they, they didn't get the tarps over the grass. And by the second week, the players were wearing spikes. They didn't want the ball to bounce. <laughs> yeah. um, with, But it, again, it's just amazing to me where... Um, people don't practice patterns mm. then they don't implement patterns mm. you know if a kid for example if they don't serve in volley in the beginning of a match then they're going to crunch time they're going to serve in volley yeah the first opportunity not happen. the first opportunity that someone has um, to um, take a weak second serve and go in you make a statement and then they end up, generally what happens they end up serving worse yeah. With that, you don't want to have the kids have the Bush League play. They're playing against somebody who's got a weak serve, and they stand in really close. <laughs> that means they're a Bush League. Yeah, I know, game and ship. But what you need is you need momentum. So there's 18 feet from the serve line to the baseline. Mm-hmm. Someone serves really slow. You can move in some, but you want the forward momentum because exactly. that's a power source. Yeah, um, I think it's important, too, just for the regular return of serve. If you know, You've got to figure out what the speed coming in where to start, how far back, but you always want to make sure that you can get some forward momentum, you know, a step going in, bisecting the angle like you talked about. And with tennis kids today, it's not to pick on them, but they don't, for the most part, play multiple sports. They're not living in a household where there's one TV, three TV stations, 
in, all, a, in, in, in a group. Pocket. Right, in a group of people watching, say, a football game, baseball game, whatever. Yeah. So you have to tell them what Bush League means. Bush League. Bush yeah. League means that you're playing so far away from the big time, you're out in the bushes. Um, asking people questions, uh, Mackenzie McDonald, he had a great run, last American yeah. standing. Um, I asked him, he had a great answer, um, what he tried to do on the return. And it's pretty simple. You aim, to the, you aim right at the net tape. You aim low if they're coming in and you aim high if they're coming back. Yeah. Uh, I think he has a great framework. The table, the great framework for stroke production. Tabletop, you know, people say, well, they don't, people don't hit the ball that way today. It's, it's really teaching framework because you can just turn like a volley and then now just increase the upward angle. You, you can hit topspin starting off like it's a tabletop. Yeah. And same thing where you could pull the racket in and sometimes you're forced to, you just have to um, be spontaneous. And that, that's really, you think about like Jimmy Connors and, and Jack Kramer, um, you know, people being able to hit a side spin approach shot, the ball stays low and kids skids off. The other thing too, I think with the tabletop, I mean, when you say turn like a volley and add a finish, you turn like a volley, the strings facing forward. But you know, when you, when the step comes in, the equal and opposite reaction is the racket is going to go back some. So, you know, you're automatically going to get a little bit of backswing there when you do that. It's not like it's going to be right like that. All the time. Although there's video, you know, Vic used to show this where Stefan Edberg would hit returns where the strings would just be facing forward the whole time. So you can't obviously, it, I mean, you could say that's a blocking type motion, but, but typically you're going to have, even if you think you're right here making a wall, there's going to be still some backswing there, a little circle. You know, when kids come out and, and do stretching, one thing is tell them, just put the racket behind your back. You know, put your arms behind it like you're hugging the racket behind you, and then just start turning. Mm -hmm. You want to always set the swing through body rotation. Yeah. You don't want to set the racket through arm movement. And then you can end up having a, a shorter, compact swing. Right. Um, you know, when you teach people to teach tennis, I've enjoyed spent a lot of time, as you know, you have as well, uh, Petrus Kuki, more from South Africa. Mm -hmm. I heard him say uh, to a player, return serve like Djokovic. You know, it's po just pound it to the middle. Yeah. And he used what I consider a Jack Kramer word. Just hit it like a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. But that, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, just pounding it downward by no means. you got to swing up. But it's just, yeah. you know, it's, it means like you feel like you got hit by a sledgehammer. Yeah. You know, you think about Federer's famous match against Sampras. It was a different era. Certainly, it was different grass. Yeah. Um, if people went back and looked at that, you wouldn't see Federer chipping like you you would years later, because he he, he knew Pete was coming in behind his serve. Right. Um, with uh, you mentioned Leighton Hewitt, um, he won the U.S. Open at age nineteen playing doubles. He won the he won Wimbledon. He won the U.S. Open. He was a player where. I think he was pretty much even, whether he's serving or returning. That's how good his return was. But I think going back to attitude, yeah, from Australian football. I mean, you know, his attitude. I mean, he, that's his background. He feels, you know, like his, you know, his father, and you know, the mentality. And um, you got to just be super aggressive. Yeah. It's almost like you know, there is the net's a barrier, but it was, you know, I think it's very, very good. I, I tell people if I was in charge of U.S. tennis. Uh, on the boys' side, I would have every young boy play football. You know, there's this Pee Wee Pop Warner football mm -hmm. where it's a collision. My father used to say it's like two mountain goats. <laughs> I mean, it's different than, say, the sport I grew up in, ice hockey. It's a, it's a, I mean, I play the, the, the Pop Warner football. It's, you just line up like mountain goats and just hit. Yeah. I used to imitate this coach that was uh, at, the, at the school. I um, used to go, as a young kid, go watch this high school football team. Go to the practices. Yeah. It's just like this. But, you know, that's the mentality yeah. is that they're coming at you with a 120 mile serve. It's like, no, you've got attitude. This is short, compact, and I'm going to hit it back as hard as it comes. Yeah. But you don't do that with a huge arm. It's kind of like, you know, if you watch guys in the NBA and they get into a fight, they don't know how to fight. Yeah. You know, they, they, um, with, uh, speaking of Vic Braden so much, is that Vic was doing some research with Gideon Ariel on, Muhammad Ali's jab. You just have people, okay, just stop this side and let your forearm go out and just feel this jolt. Mm -hmm. 
so they, they got a phone call and said, we don't want you to tell anybody <laughs> how the champ does it. Yeah, exactly. And they're, and they're like, okay, all right. It was kind of a threatening phone call. That was also with, uh, it was Edwin Moses, with the hurdler. Hurdler, where yeah. Where they found out his secret. And <laughs> a short time after, the lawyers came in and said, you are not allowed to get this information out into the public. Yeah. Because they didn't want to give it um, a secret. Yeah, so I mentioned the one-handers. Um, you could just see people so quickly. You should be able to tell. You're sitting in the stands or 78 feet away from one baseline to the next. You know you need to know the grips. So if someone has a mm. a, a one-handed backhand, um, like Ash Barty, I mean, she got beat, great player. Um, she's a little bit too far over with her right grip, top, the bottom grip, her right hand, and, and uh, she's... A little outside in. I mean, she's a great, great player, um, but she's hitting so many underspin returns. And if it, it, if you're if you're floating it, so then your opponent has time to run around it and set up for a forehand. Yeah. Um, Schwartzman, Schwartzman, Schwartzman. He's little, but his return is not little. He's a small guy. He's like always right at the top of uh, returns. Yeah, I think the mentality again, like you said with Hewitt, is like just dig in. They're gonna they're gonna be like a bulldog and and get it back, get it in play, and then and then grind that next ball, get into the point. With, um, you know, so a college kid out of campus, you know, I think most college tennis players they don't do baskets for the most part. You know, feed each other baskets, toss each other balls. Yeah. Um, but if you could find a backboard, I mean, that's, I think, a, I mean, um, you know, say some young guys out playing futures, a gal, they just, they get to a new site. They want to find out if there's a backboard. Yeah. And it just, you know, just like we should, um, we tell people all the time in tennis, they should have a golfer's mentality. Golfers don't become too cool for school when it comes to shadow swinging. Yeah. They're really into strokes. Of course, yeah. the scoring system I always say, all right, the golfers, they shot a 72. Maybe they shot an 82. But, you know, they get together and it's like misery joins company. Well, on the first hole, on the first shot, mm -hmm. they go through it the whole way. Everyone, yeah. Third hole, fifth shot. Fifth shot, third shot. Mm -hmm. Fifth hole, third shot. Um, so the wall, the wall, the wall. With um, learning by circumstance. You know, a lot of times kids hit against the backboard they don't really know that they're practicing all this chunking where they just get out there and just, you tell some go over there and just rip the ball at the middle. And I, I send kids to our wall. I go do that. And you're going to have a better return to serve. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have the square yep. and just say, how many balls can you get in and out of the square? Yeah. Um, Peter Burwatch was very creative. You just have people rally with two balls. And it's amazing how they have to improve their focus mm -hmm. and they can do it. Um, so you start off just service line to service line. They each have a ball in their hand and say, ready, go. And they both rallying two balls. Yeah. They got to move their feet. They got to, and they're focused. Yeah. You know, we, we do this Peter Burwash drill where you get um, four people to net and they're volleying with three balls. Yeah. At one time. Those are fun. And um, so the verbiage over and over again, it's like a volley with an added follow through, it's like a volley, take a racket around the beach ball. Um, reaction time, quick hand drills. You see people with their coach, they're under the stadium, at the grand slams, and they're tossing these balls back and forth very quickly. Um, in the sport, I grew up in goalies. Um, you, you can take a player to a backboard, put the player in front of you, and you're behind them with the basket of balls. And they don't know whether you feed the ball to the right or to the left. And then they have to return. So it's... It's, 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 it's very difficult to just pound the ball yourself. So you hit the first one, you just, you hit that. So you're tracking it, you know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. They have the coach behind you um, with reducing the distance. Yeah. Um, you know, rapid fire feeding to get people, uh, Baltier used to do this. And, you know, you, you said it's so true is that you, know, you have better ground strokes, you're going to have better returns. You have better returns, you'll have better ground strokes. But Nick used to feed one ball, and before the person's hit the first one, he'd feed the second one. Mm -hmm. And then you could do the rapid fire 
um, where it's not just forehand, forehand, forehand. It can be forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand. So then they have to keep turning their body and adjusting. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a Hopman and I think a Lansdorp, the speed feeding. None of the, now you get over to the point where, okay, you've got strokes, so now we're not going to give you any more courtesy feeds. Yeah. Um, kids need to learn how to feed balls. You know you're in trouble when you have someone come and work with you, a junior tennis player, they're right-handed, mm -hmm. and they don't know enough to put the basket on their left hip. Yeah. That's someone who's lessened out. That's someone who's never got out there with a basket of balls and a, and a friend and said, okay, let's just drill. Yeah. Um, but when people feed, they need to turn. It's like, you know, they're on a conventional stance for a forehand and they're, they're definitely feeling the body segments on that front foot when they're yeah. cranking balls. Yeah. You don't want to get into the teaching pro, um, grip or style feeding with, um, here's a great drill for the return of serve. Um, you gotta be careful where, um, you know, no one's going to get hurt. A lot of times the ball is going to bounce off the kid's racket and hit him in the eye. If you, if you speed it up beyond their recognition skills, beyond how much chunking they've done. So you put a kid in the service box and you have people serve at him and he's just got to take it out of the air. He's got to just have quick hands. The biggest thing is he can't be afraid of it. Yeah, It's human nature when someone's serving 120 is not to go towards it. And not a volley. You're, you're, you're saying a, a swing, you know. A well, you start with swing. volleys. You start with volleys. Just, you know, they're in the service box. But an added follow through once once you get a hang of it. Well, once they get the hang of it, you'd want to actually just turn and crank a ground stroke. Yeah, you know, it's like with Agassi, the uh, story um, mentioned on a previous podcast. I mean, reinforcement's good. Is that one of our uh, students that we trained was with with him and saw this? Is Agassi's? Uh, now he's got a son who plays baseball, but he he was with Aaron Krigstein and Steve Young, so three of them, and they're at a baseball pitching machine yeah Agassi just takes a bat says turn it up as fast as it'll go yeah and he runs forward with a baseball bat taking a tennis swing taking him right out of the air yeah. like but he was trained as a little kid um you know again coming back to um reflexes and he's got a great brain type you know the st brain type if if you want to go back and listen to our episode on brain typing but the sts have the best you know motor and motor um hand-eye coordination and motor skills as far as being fine motor dominant. So uh, Jimmy Aries says this got about that in his, in his arsenal. Yeah. Another thing too, is that uh, he's, he's not a forever push. He's a one ball blast. Jimmy Aries is a little bit older. And I mean, he's one of Nick's first. I mean, Carling Bassett was there and, and uh, you know, even, you know, Nick, he, he started off Brian Godfrey, but he really for them for years and years, he didn't teach juniors. Mm. He taught adults. Yeah, I, I mentioned I worked for a company where uh, Harry Hopman was with the juniors and Nick was with the adults. Mm. But Jimmy says that uh, he couldn't figure it out because when Andre was younger, he was, but they were tr at the same facility and balls are flying everywhere. And, and, and Nick was going, that's it, that's it. <laughs> with, you have a better chance of having the racket face be vertical at the hip, be correct at the hip by swinging fast and swinging slow with um borg mcenroe um it's too bad borg uh not so much for borg perhaps but for us i mean selfish fans your guy is in the wimbledon final six times wins it five he played the french eight times won that what six and so so he retires early but he was he was too far back he had a reset swing on the backhand took the racket low high to compensate for that he moved way back Akinro comes along, he can hit the left serve, the left hand serve, really pull him off the court. And that was a positive. Arthur Ashe, when he came on the scene, I mean, he was there before them. So uh, Mackinac came on the scene, I should say. What Ashe would do, uh, you know, you, you do stand in a different position when you're playing a lefty to bisect the potential angle of the serve. Yeah. Is Ashe would just stand on one side and say, okay, if you're going to hit an ace. Yeah. You got to be doing it down the tee. Right now, you're going to go T. <laughs> yeah. If or he said, okay, you stand T, and now you got to do it wide. And he was just playing the math, the stats. Like, okay, I'm going to make you hit a second serve. Yeah. You know, the ace is yours. You know, if not, I'm giving you the opening. Yeah. I think that's where it comes down to 
you know, if you're playing for money or big time tennis, I mean, club tennis too, but if you can scout your opponent or know a little bit about what, what they can do, how far wide can they take it? Can they kick it out wide? You know, then you can know beforehand, okay, here's where my position should be to bisect the angle or, okay, this person has this really good slicer, but I'm just going to take it away from them like that. Um, Agassi Sampras. They played five majors. Sampras won four or five. Rivalry was closer at 20 for Sampras, 14 for, for Agassi. Um, this is probably the only thing I look up. I mean, these notes, um, just, I'm sitting down watching a little tennis. It's okay. I write a few things down and return serve. But with Bill Tilden, what beats baseline? So Agassi was so close to the baseline. He can take the ball on the rise. His net will be baseline. What will be the according to Tilden? What will beat net is topspin. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, as great a returner as Agassi was, Sampras was, was so good at scoring out the racket face on the volley, gliding, having the momentum going forward, so he could come in behind it. Yeah. Um, with it just it just baffles me how there's less and less people going to the net. Yeah. Um, Here's an interesting thing. Agassi and Becker talk about scouting opponents is after he retired, he told people he knew where Becker was serving. Mm-hmm. If his yeah. tongue was out to the right, he served to the right. Tongue was out to the left, he knew the ball was going to the left. Yeah. Um, the, um, but the return of serve, we go through some more of the notes here, another page. Talking about Connors and Agassi, the legacy, Jimmy, my legacy, he was asked, is taking the ball on the rise. And Andre had enough respect to remember what Jimmy said. Said, I took it one step further in, in hitting the ball on the rise. Yeah. When kids are rallying, if they're rallying and the balls are bouncing up above their shoulder, if they're just rallying at 50%, they're backing up off the baseline. They're not going to have a good return. Yeah. If they don't rally where they're moving their feet and it's just a bounce hit rhythm, it's like, you know, that's where kids who play other sports, you know, say a kid who, you know, they're the talented kid and they're chosen for um, shortstop. You know, a lot of balls can go to short the shortstop position and they're going to, the short hop, they yeah. go in and take it early. Yeah. And, you know, so it's, when it comes down to, um, you know, coming back to Serena, Oh, she's got such a great serve. She's she got a great return to serve. Mm-hmm. While the baseball, what's well, very good for the throwing motion, the hand-eye catching a ball, mm-hmm. but actually charging a ball or someone just hits a line drive and you're just going, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're, if someone grounds out right to the shortstop, they're charging the ball because yeah. they want to beat the, the runner to first base. Yeah. So that's where kids today, I mean, you know, we have kids that play pretty decent tennis and they, when you ask them to throw a ball, they hang on to it like a shot put. I mean, they, so, um, so you, you think of baseball, the, the throwing is the serving, but the, the catching, you yeah. know, just think of a catcher hanging in there and go, okay, this is, this guy's going to try to throw the ball 90 miles an hour. And you're just right in there catching it. Um, I know absolutely nothing about cricket, certainly watched it played in certain countries that I've taught in. You know, you're at a picnic and the kids are over there on the side and, um, you know, there's a, a, a bat, a, um, what do you call it, a cricket bat? And so. but the baseball bat and the cricket bat, um, they're not so big. Yeah. They're not so big. Uh, I remember playing wiffle ball and I was the youngest of six kids and then they came out with this big plastic wiffle ball bat. It yeah. was like, great. Yeah. Now I can hit. Exactly. Um, so some kid who's... Uh, um, just doing a lot of different hand-eye coordination. So just two kids rallying with the ping pong instead of being an idiot, sorry. And like, well, who's going to win? And they're just playing a competitive game of ping pong. If they're tennis players, why don't you just try to rally two balls, two ping pongs? You're tennis players. Yeah. Um, Bill Price, uh, this amazing story, is back in the day, people who taught tennis, it was more of a hobby. It wasn't a profession. So he's a businessman. And he um, loves tennis. So I mean, Bobby McKinley, um, you know, he was top 50 in the world. His brother played Wimbledon once, Chuck, and won it. What he would do is go to the 
go to the baseball field, pick out a kid who's really athletic and sit, talk to the parents. And if you do this, if you buy a ping pong table and you have your kids hang on to the ping pong paddle like they're playing tennis mm -hmm. and your kids come out and watch me teach tennis on the weekend, they just sit and watch me teach some lessons, mm -hmm. then I'll take your kid on for free. Mm -hmm. Well, and McKinley took him up on that. And, and so did others. And uh, I mean, you think all the way to Wimbledon with uh, fear, um, hitting, fear of hitting a baseball, fear of uh, get, of heading a soccer ball to, I think, block a hockey puck. Someone who, um, kids today, they used to say that when I was a kid, like we watch too much TV. Kids today with... I always think of, sorry. Go ahead, go. I was going to say, when you think of getting hit by a, a hockey puck, I just think of Happy Gilmore when, you know, he, he doesn't get, doesn't make the team and then he goes to the driving range, not to the driving range, but to the pitching machine and he gets in front of it and just has the ball hit him and he's like, oh, yeah, bring that. I love it. You know? and he's like, Badge of honor. I can remember, uh, well, the definition of an optimist is a parent who's taken their kid to the orthodontist and then also signed them up for hockey. But when I played hockey, there wasn't a, a face shield. I remember my father coming to a prep school hockey game and I was away from home and I wasn't wearing a mouth guard. I didn't know what he was upset about, but it, the fact is I wasn't wearing a mouth guard. But I, I remember that it, it, hoping that I would lose my teeth. Yeah, exactly. It's like, cause that's it's, the badge of honor. <laughs> that's the badge of honor. But... Uh, kids don't play, you know, like say, um, I'm talking about the return to serve. So if a group of kids say, go play tackle football, if, if, if you um, tell people to do that, now they look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. I tell people on a weekly basis, read the book, Amazing Racers. Mm -hmm. And Bill Harris, the, the coach, he gets his uh, high school cross country teams in a circle and they're running in place and he just says, hit it. Yeah. Like a football team. And they all just hit, hit the ground They get dirty. Yeah. Um, with, How do you uh, think that would go over at most clubs these days? Not too good. I mean, yeah. with, um, you know, I just feathered a few balls the other day. I said, as a kid, a kid come up and I said, turn, come up to that turn, turn around. And I just hit a few, hit a few balls, hit them right in the back. Mm -hmm. And they, there was like two kids on the sidelines, in group, group squad training. They were just shocked. And I'm just, <laughs> I, and then I just give them the gears. Mm -hmm. But then you tell people, okay, Feed tennis balls and stop it with your chest. Mm. Get your body in front of it. Yeah. And, you know, kind of comes back to human nature on a serve is you got to go towards it. I mean, you can't wimp out. You can't wimp out. I mean, tennis ball, it's not like a, you're, some kid is trying to do a backflip on a balance beam. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you have to really talk to kids like, you know, how can you be afraid of going to the net to hit a volley? Yeah. It's still just a little two ounce yellow tennis ball. That's where the, the skills have to be, have to be there. You know, if you have, good volley skills you're not going to be afraid when you go to the net and the same thing with the return if if you have good mechanics good skills you won't be so afraid doubles if you have two righties and this there's so many myths in tennis you go all the way to wimbledon the macho male ego we should have a podcast just on doubles it's 127 i think project we can we can we can uh, keep going and, and go through double strategy yeah but you have two righties playing um, the more consistent player will play more shots in the deuce court. Why? So if you and I are playing doubles, you're in the deuce court, I'm in the ad court, first game goes five points. You, you've taken three, I've taken two. So next time we return, you're taking four, I'm still at two. And this is where it gets interesting, is 85% of players are right-handed. Easily 85% of players are told volley with a strong continental grip. And where's that strong continental grip face? It yeah. faces left field. It faces the deuce court. Yeah, 85% of players are right-handed. And it's it's just sad how many people, especially in developmental tennis, they run around their backhand return. How are they ever going to have a backhand? Mm -hmm. So they run around their backhand return. And doing that, the ball climbs up high. Now they don't get the racket below the ball. They have horizontal swing. Where's it go? It goes to left field. It goes to the deuce court. Now in baseball... You know, who they put in right field is the kid who's picking his nose. You know, the kid who can't catch the ball, the kid who's out there picking dandelions. Hey, you're in right field. That means you can't catch. <laughs> so um, the deuce court player makes the ad court player famous. So when you see the macho male ego, they 
typically will put the woman, mixed mixed doubles, mixed troubles, they'll put the woman in the deuce court. Go, oh, honey, I got it. Yeah. Watch me. Yeah. So then they pull horizontally across their body on the, on the backhand, yeah. and it goes, they have a That's better chance, <laughs> better chance to go away from the net person. Yeah. The person in the deuce court goes, they don't go inside out. Yeah. They don't go away from their body. Yeah. It goes right to the net person. Yeah. I uh, wonder how those stats have changed with no ad scoring you know, as far as how many points a player will play. Well, there's some interesting rules, too, with no ad is that, um, you know, like gender to gender, and the man has to teach to serve to the man or the woman has to serve to the woman or yeah. you in, in, in developmental training, uh, it should be that you have to alternate. You, you have to take turns. Um, and certainly, you know, I was just thinking of running around. I mean, certainly when you play, you know, if you have a chance to run around and be aggressive and go with your weapon or whatever, you you'd want to do that. But as far as developmentally, you can't be running around all the time or else you're never going to have a backhand or backhand volley where that same thing happens. Yeah. Um, so when it comes down to return to serve, you know, um, you know, people people leave the house or people are going off to a tournament. And you say, "Good luck." <laughs> but really, it's it, it's it's a good skill, great skill. Um, work on your turn return right back at you. Many happy returns with. But it comes back to. When a youngster comes out to learn how to play, ready position, racket centered, yeah, unit turn, yeah, um, you know the the grip determines the angle of the racket face, the options. So when you turn, you have to be ready to take a ball in the air first. It's going to bounce second, but most kids when they turn, the way they're hanging out of the racket today, it's like no, I'm only hitting ground strokes, yeah. and it, the the in a nutshell. You asked the first time they had rankings, yeah, it was for 13 and under. So now kids are playing much earlier. But also, too, kids having these, uh, the rackets of today. You know, Sampras was asked, if your son played tennis, what would you recommend? And he said, yeah. have him play with a wooden racket. Yeah. With that, um, kids are just trying to win a point on the forehand. You chart people, about 50 points played in a set. And then the five patterns of points, there's not that many. If they have any offense, and it sounds like doom and gloom, but, you know, clones taught by clowns is everyone's playing the same, is that they're just looking to hit a forehand. And But when, when that happens, that people see that in the rally and they, they see the offensive, the risk the person takes. They mm -hmm. go for the $100 shot from the 10 cent position. Mm -hmm. So people see the kid trying to hit a big forehand. A lot of times they don't see that. They're doing it on the return, too. It's yeah. like, no, learn to hit a backhand. Yeah. You know, I think really with anything is that um, start, you know, we have the, the title of our academic curriculum, the great base, get a solid foundation. Yeah. And um, yeah, at a high level of play, players are going to be able to serve to your backhand. You, you've got to be able to have a backhand. You know, I think the reps, um, you know, with uh, it's not obviously the same hitting against a backboard. Um, speed training, having the ball come really back really fast. You're not reading it come off the racket. Um, I do think that kids can get lessened out. They can get programmed out. Um, you know, things that don't make money anymore. You don't see you don't see backboards being built. Yeah, they don't make money. Um, people need to, if they could, you know, build one at their house. You don't see ladders. You know, people aren't junior tennis players aren't calling. Um, and there's life skills from that too. They're not calling up adults and say, "Hey, you want to play?" Yeah. So they're they're not playing that many sets. Um, I think of uh, Martina Hingis's mother. Um, you know, she had her daughter at uh, um, Saddlebrook over in Tampa, and, and also she was down at Balateri's at times, and she wanted her daughter to hit with everybody, mm -hmm. hit with everybody, so you could see, see a different ball, right. read the racket. Um, Right. So t tennis players also come, become very clicky. Um, it comes down to uh, years ago, the, the the players had one grip, and that also came from the, you know wooden rackets yeah. going to the net. Certainly being told to use a continental grip on everything. Yeah. When people would hit vol when you hit volleys against a backboard, backboards should be tilted back at fifteen degrees. Right. 
So when it comes down to uh, Francois Durr, the French player, top 10 player in the world, she had a 3-5 ladies club serve, mm -hmm. and she put in the peach position, and she hit a knuckleball. It just floated, and the pros had a real difficult time. Um, you know, we see people, the young gal. The timing you, issue. Right. Yeah. You know, they're, um, they're penalized for being early. Yeah. You know, today we're the modern forehand and people are not teaching the follow through a tracking motion. And there's all this witchcraft, all this mumbo jumbo, and people are pulling horizontally. And then you just ask the parents, you know, the young, young, young gal was out here being filmed the other day. I asked her, and she's a very accomplished player. But I asked, doing a video analysis with a, a junior and their parent or parents, I said, has your child ever complained about playing against pushers? Well, first of all, I don't even want them to use that word, pusher. But yeah. uh, defensive specialists, right. I mean, Borg, Nadal, you call them pushers. <laughs> I mean, they're just human backboards. And you got to respect that. But so in the ball, uh, that's where a lot of people, they, they, some kids, they, they just like to hit with the coach. You know, they have, they have glorified sparring partners. If they're hitting with someone who's um, hitting the ball slow, I mean, it's short, soft, and they're early. Um, so that, you, have to, you have to have a tracking motion. You have to yeah. have a long hitting zone. Yeah. The racket's got to go out to the target. I've got, um, we've answered some of these, but I've got some questions that were sent in um, through Instagram. So maybe we go through, through some of those here to finish up. Um. First one I have is drills for quality of contact. You know, I think drills, okay, you know, I think when well, you're practicing return, but when I think quality of contact is exactly what you just talked about is getting a longer hitting zone and really what's going to do that. So if you were to practice this as a drill is to keep your head still. It's so, so important. If your head, you know, pulls off, looks off early, your eyes look off early, then the body pulls and then the racket pulls. So a good drill may be to, you know, have where you keep your eyes at the hit and just finish with your upper arm or your shoulder coming under your chin before you look up, um, you know, palm to your target, but really any kind of return situation, but just focusing on keeping your head still, I think is going to help you the most for quality of contact. I think when it comes down to, you know, first impressions are everlasting. People come to our place, we film them and then we, we have to really unteach. We have to subtract yeah. movements. We have to go backwards. Yeah. The kid's got to take 10 steps back to take a hundred steps forwards. So a kid's going to be out playing singles or doubles and I'll just blow the whistle or yell, Hey, everybody stop. Yeah. And we just do 42, 48 seconds. I mean, if it's 70 central strokes, 80 central strokes. Yeah. And they just slow motion, go through it. And I think when people come to observe what we do, they think, well, okay, you know, we don't ever play points. Well, when the umpire says ready play, you have to be able to play, but you, ha you have to do, you have to do prep work. Yeah. But coming back to drills, when a kid is taught the ready position, day one, get go, that's a drill for the return of serve. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ba it's always basics. Um, how to return fast and high serves. So if you're playing John Isner and the ball's coming in fast and high, you know, for me to answer that would be, well, got to have the skills to take a, sh a short swing if it's coming in fast if it, the ball's up high you know you've got to try to take the ball earlier um, but also with the swing itself you know you don't want to try to come down on the ball you still got to swing up so you know we use that phrase finish you know swing high to higher when the ball's up higher um, but yeah take the ball early you got to be able to take the ball on the rise if you can and have a short compact swing at one time i was working with uh Karina Marariu. Yeah. And her, hit with her. Her wow. coach, uh, Andrew, I couldn't pronounce his name. Uh, you may have to edit this. I used to just introduce him as uh, Andrew Son of a Bitch. <laughs> and um, we'll let that one slide. But it, it, his name sounded very much like that. So, anyway, uh, what an amazing program she had. So, I, I eventually talked to, convinced her dad because I was just charting matches. You know, I, she would come twice a week and I would set up a match and chart it. And then uh, I told, I asked him a couple of times, "Hey, I need to film your daughter." And he's like, "He wasn't, he wasn't for it." I said, "I, t I said, I tell you what, I'll film her, and um, just you and I'll look at it." Yeah. 
And then you know, so we have it documented, the, the, the changes she made. But Colin Dibley was a police officer, an Australian, and he was a mate, of Rod Lavers. They used to practice together. And Laver said, you should try pro tennis. So he's a late starter. And one time he had the fastest serve in the world. But Albin Morariu, he had his daughter do once a week, smart guy, is that she took lessons from, she took an hour and a half lesson with um, Colin Dibley. And he said, he, what, the, what he, he demanded, he was the architect. He said, serve to her for an hour, then you can do anything you want for 30 minutes. Yeah. So she, she's a young kid and she's trying to practice, Return, returning against one of the fastest servers in, in the world at one yeah. time. I think with that question too, you know, high servers, you, you want to prepare with a racket up high. You know, that's where people that go back and low, they're going to struggle with higher balls. So, you know, again, back, like you said, with the ready position, you make your initial turn with a racket head up. Speaking of returns. Like and that's what she did. You know, Karina, she learned to to make her backhand not go down up. It wasn't a reset. Yeah, she had the Don Ho Alo High. Yeah. <laughs> the Hawaiian singer. She Aloha. went she went Alo High. Yeah. And um, in a ritual, she still has a racket low, but she changed it. I mean, with Davenport, she won Wimbledon. Yeah. And it was, one. you know, changed her backhand. Yeah. Backhand return. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on open stance on the backhand side for returns of fast serves? Well, I think your father danced with Fred Astaire. I mean, yep. when people ask me about stances. You have to be able to do it all. Yeah. And, you know, we have kids just shadow swing, drop hit do it off every stance. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sometimes you're forced to hit open. The kids who never hit with a square stance, we call it conventional, mm -hmm. step straight out. Yeah, neutral. And then when you have them do that, then they're too close to the ball. So right. um, you can serve very slowly to people and say, okay, practice off this foot, practice off that foot. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I hear it all the time, like it's old school, you know, yeah. everything's open stance. Yeah. And, I, you know, why don't you start using some film? Yeah. No, I think for the return of serve, I mean, you'll see that with a one hand or anything, a Becker, you know, where you, you, you make your initial turn and your left foot turns out, pivots, right? And then, so you're already kind of open that way. And then if the ball's coming in close towards the body, then it's more of an open stance, one handed backhand. And then other times they'll still step out with a left and then make the step and the swing together. It's, it's just like Dennis Vandermeer. He used to have the seven steps of the volley. You know, one was no volley. You just turn. Yeah. Then was one, one where you have, you have to sidestep. One where you step underneath, you take your foot step backwards. Yeah. Then it was one step, two step, multiple steps. Yeah. And it's the same. Yeah. You got to be able to adapt. Um, now th that's one thing too, is that is it just comes through practice. You know, no one is, no one's going to give you a, 30 minute lesson and then you got chunking down to the expert lesson, right? The expert level. Yeah. Another one when returning a first serve, should you try to return it flatter? So you aren't pulling off the shot too early. What do you say? No, I mean, um, we did talk about where if, if serves coming in big, you know, and they use a shorter swing, like a wall to the ball, usually the upward swing, like there's a video I put up of Federer not too long ago, and you know, it's a flatter trajectory, maybe a 20 degree upward swing, but you, you want to have a hitting zone. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily hit flatter. You, you can still hit topspin, but it depends on the speed of the serve. But kind of like the first question, quality of contact, you know, you still want to have a tracking motion if you're hitting topspin, but, you know, a flatter shot, yeah, you're going to be a little more linear. Um, well, you got to be able to do it all. The, you know, I think yeah, exactly. if, uh, you know, we interviewed uh, Richard Hernandez. I actually quote my students, Steve. Richard Hernandez. People, remember, people aren't dumb. They're completely dumb. And that's not true. But when it comes down to picking up the tennis racket, Welby Van Horn, and people pick up the tennis racket, they reduce their IQ in half. Yeah. So someone's serving, and you're trying to hit a winner off their serve. We're telling you, like the, the Nick Valtteri, right back at you, baby. Mackenzie McDonough, if they're coming in, go to the net trap, go right at them. Yeah. But it's a pretty safe bet that you're playing against somebody who's got an open racket face on their volley. So you're much better off to try to get the return low. Yeah. So 
you, when it comes down to it, initially you'd want to have the capability of taking your return flat, establishing the territory, stand close to the baseline. It's more linear. It's like a volume and added follow through. But as you get used to their serve, you want to use almost the same exact movement, but then you're going to get underneath it because you want to return it. You want to return with top. Mm. You want to get the bat ball down below the level of the net. So they're in the green zone. They're in the forecourt, 10 and a half feet in. But if you get the ball below the level of the net, most passing shots are one on the second passing shot. Yeah. What you need to do is make your return. Yep. It's like in, in doubles. If you can serve and make your first volley, you got a great chance of holding serve. Yeah. What you're, Big responsibility is in doubles is make your return. Yep. You got to make your return. You know, that's something else about doubles is that um, people think, well, you always hear this, play some doubles. It'll be really good for your game. I think it was two years ago where Tissipas, you know, he was playing some doubles and the tournament director of Italian Open said, because he thought because he signed up, like, you know, 11 singles players signed up. Now, a lot of times the pros out at Indian Wells, because they like to stay out there, it's not a two-week tournament. It's like it's, it's a 10-day tournament. Yeah. And they kick out because the, they're ranked higher than some of the double specialists. So if someone's ranked 45 in the world in doubles and someone's ranked 44 in the world in singles, the singles player gets in. Um, but playing doubles is very good for your return. It's not just good for, yeah. uh, for net play. Exactly. Another question. We went through this quite a bit, but best way to practice returns against the wall. I know, you know, you were talking about just even just going out and ripping the wall, hitting the, you know, hitting it, try to hit it through the wall. The ball comes back quickly. You got to really move your feet and prepare fast. Yeah. Say you go to the public park and uh, maybe take tape. I told kids, just take a piece of piece of chalk, make a square. Yeah. And it's like Kobe Bryant. Um, how do you teach someone to play basketball from three years old? Don't lower the hoop. Four years old, don't lower the hoop. Have them stand um, just you know, right next to the basket. And then, you know, if it takes them two or three months to start getting the ball in the hoop. And then what do you do next? Take one step back and do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, basically the half volley with tennis terminology, it really shouldn't be called the half volley. You come to the net, you want a volley. Okay, next would be a low volley. Then so it's down by your feet, like the, the shortstop getting the bad hop or charging the ball to get it on the hop. I mean, like bounce hit. Yeah. So you do, you just start up close. Yeah. Just start up close. Hit a target. And just very, very small. Um, you know, you can even have people go up and try to hit with their hand. Um, I mean, when you start telling people, okay, we filmed you, and say just on the forehand, and you say, this is what you do with your hand. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's how a snake goes down a hole. Yeah. And you mean, the best returners, there's not that much difference between, say, Connors, um, Agassi, and Djokovic. Just how they line up, short, compact. Yeah. Uh, the girl that beat Barty, I, I heard uh, she's working with Jan Kodish. Um, he was a, you know, a little bit before Connors. Um, Jack, he had a one-hander, but he was known at his time to be like, this is the guy to watch on the return. And it's just classic how you would hit, you know, just like a volley and then right underneath. Yeah. You know, when you make a unit turn, the racket is, it's always facing your belly button. It just, it just never goes past your belly button. Yeah. Okay. Um, targets for singles, targets for doubles. Like, um, <laughs> we can answer that really simply. I mean, I think the, we, we did kind of answer that already. If someone's coming to the net, you try to get it low to their feet. And if someone's staying back, you're just basically trying to get it back in play, but deep down the middle. I think, you know, the analytics, a lot of the stuff is, you know, if you can get it a little bit towards the backhand side on the court, but, you know, deep through the middle. Well. Making the return. That's one thing. Singles. When, when a young kid is in the driveway shooting basketballs, the target assures them that they're getting better. Mm. You know, when people come up to a foul line basketball, I mean, it's so similar. If your feet are straight ahead, your shoulders are square, this is your palms going to go to the target. Yeah. Tennis is the same thing. Your yeah. target, like a basketball hoop, it's small and it's elevated. Yeah. Now, when it comes down to it, you would think that servers would mix it up because if they're always staying back, then you can get into a groove and just you're trying to just hit deep returns. But if, if you don't know whether they're coming in or not, yeah. and if they're not mixing it up. Dick Gould, 
Um, I don't care how the Stanford coach, 17 titles. I don't care how you get there. You get, go twice a game. Yeah. Um, Matt Clore, who's spent so much time with us, he, he was a guest on our podcast and he spent so much time with Mackenzie McDonald is Roger Federer told McDonald, you know, go to the, go to the net at least twice a game. Yeah. So, um, there you, it's amazing that kids don't play against a certain volleyer. That's where a lot of kids, they don't know how to hit passing shots because yeah. they're not playing against people that come to the net. Yeah. Oh, I think, um, and then for the doubles target, I mean, obviously the return to serve, you know, you're, tr you're trying to keep it away from the biggest threat, which is the person at the net. So the first thing would be to try to go. And if the server's coming in, you know, you could aim at the, the service box on the other side of the corner. That would be a good general target. I know Vic used to always joke around and, and say, you know, and if you could do that consistently, you know, send me a postcard from Wimbledon. But but that would be the goal. Um, and then obviously if someone's staying back, then you could go deep and try to get yeah. in. And then, and then from there, it's you, know, you got to mix it up if they're there's, there, there's definitely a range. Uh, we tell people in singles, take a cone three and a half feet in from the single side on each side. Of course, 27 feet wide. Now you get 20 feet hit through the yeah. middle. Yeah. Um, and in doubles, obviously, as you said, you want to get the ball away from the net person, but you want to do that within a range. You don't want to go so far wide that you're always uh, on a return, giving them the option right. to go angle. down the line or angle, but gets an angle. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you mentioned yeah. Warren Pretorius. I love how he played with Peter Mallet. Mm. They, they won some age group doubles, national titles. Don't play great, play solid. Yeah. Most people try to play over their head and they press too much. Um, the, you know, I will, you know, I go up to juniors and go, are you playing Rafa? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you have to play in gears and you, you have to improve in stages. Yeah. Play, play within yourself. But, um, you know, Welby Van Horn, one of the worst things that can happen to somebody is they hit a lucky shot. They hit a lucky shot, and everybody's done that. So they've hit that one screamer, and they go, oh, I hit that I, once. I own it. You know, Vic, I, I hit that shot once five years ago. I'm yeah. still still looking for it. In 1955, in that tornado, I <laughs> hit that. Um, okay, so the return serve. Uh, timing of the split step. We, we talked about that a little bit. I think, you know, when you really slow things down, you'll see with the split step that when the server's making contact, the people are really in the air. And so you'll be landing, you know, you're getting that early read, read, but you'll be landing with one foot kind of already in the direction of the, the ball. Yeah, you'll see, player, you see players warming up and they're making the, the, the jumps where you got to pre-stretch those calf muscles. I mean, you have to be able to jump through the gym. Uh, um, this young guy who's now in the semifinals, yeah. the Russian. Yeah, um, he's got some calves. I mean, he looks like he could jump through the gym. Yeah. You know, this, uh, I think it was great what Dimitrov said about him is that he wasn't shocked. I mean, somebody who's ranked 114 in the world is a great tennis player. Yeah. I think the other thing with a split stub, I mean, for people returning, you know, think of like, okay, Roger Federer, you know, they're kind of hunched over and then they're twirling the racket, but then you got to watch how they come up. The center of gravity comes up. So they got high center of gravity, and then when they land, that's where the pre-stretch happens of, of the muscles. So for some of the listeners out there, if you're a club player or whatnot, you, you know, you're know you not going to yeah. stay hunched down. You're at, you're, your body's going to come up high. You're going to have a high center of gravity. And, 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 and yeah, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that. Vilas was a very popular player from Argentina. In his service return ritual, he had his feet so far apart. But then the camera would go to the server, and he but he would jump up. So... In, Returners don't get down like a sprinter because they're not going to go in a straight line. Yeah. So they come up with a high center of gravity. You can move left. So then they can move right or left. Like they have a giant letter V in front of them. You know. Exactly. So that's the same as the volley. The, the um, you know, the kid who goes in and is, you know, building the myelin, the chunking skills for, you know, reading a passing shot. You know, if you never go to the net, you're not going to be able to read passing shots. And so... You know, you're obviously going to return server. You just you're not in the game, but there's a that V for both. You know, you're up at the net, you V off, you're going diagonally, and then the same thing. And you know, kids who never play, um, Margaret Court, who played um, 
you know, she played and I mean, Yvonne Gulagong, they were both uh, Wimbledon champions that it, as mo- as moms, and then um, not at Wimbledon, but the Kleisters from Belgium when the U.S. Open. But Margaret Court used to say, yeah, I got to start playing. I've just been walking the plank, mm. meaning that she's just going side to side on the baseline, just rallying. Mm. Um, just going out rallying is not playing. Yeah. <laughs> walking the plank. A um, couple more. When should you take a forehand inside in or out from the ad court? Well, let me say this, and then you can answer <laughs> it. Is that the commentate the commentators? I heard Lindsay Davenport, it's Australian Open time, and was listening to her, and and the, the commentators are correct. The coach is correct if they're saying that was a inside in, inside in, out. inside 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 outside inside. It gets confusing. That's related to the target. But what inside out means to a technician, and that term was first used in technical terms, it means you're swinging from close to away from your body. Yeah. So that's where Barty's a great player, but when she hits her two-hander and she favors the one-hander, and that's not as an offensive shot. Yeah. The one-hander ideally is for you to use when you're going forward. You take speed off the shot. Yeah. The, the ball's in trans- transition, or you're in transition. So as the ball's in flight, you can get close to the net. Yeah. You keep the ball low. You give your opponent less pace. Lost start. So the way she's returning, that's for that's a great skill she has for approaching. Yeah. She needs to really clean up her two-hander. And, and be, but she doesn't swing yeah. inside out. She's going outside in. So then the lever, she gets close to her body, yeah. and she makes unforced errors. Yeah. So all swings are inside out. But, you know, I think, again, with, with the return – I think your first goal, make the return, give yourself a big target. But if you're in a position where you've got an easy second serve and you feel like you can be aggressive, you know, like we say to the percentage post, you just got to be careful. If you go inside in, you know, from the ad court, it better be good because if, if not, you're leaving a lot of the court open. And then, you know, inside out, obviously, depends on where the target is, how far over you're aiming. But again, you don't want to make unforced errors. So give yourself a big target. If somebody you're playing has a crummy backhand, which is a lot of people out there, then that's a good target um, to take no, it, yeah, par- take it parents, inside out. Parents have asked me for years, you know, my child complains that you're always telling them not to run around their backhand. When can they run around the backhand? Well, they can do it in the offensive area of the red zone. Yeah. But actually, when they're top 10 in the country in the 18s, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're top 10 in the 14s, hit a backhand. Yeah. You know, so people, you, you need to get kids to a point where they're so good, you can say, ready, play. Yeah. You know, it's it's like same thing in music. Yeah. You know, they take lessons, take lessons. But then they're, when they become a performer, they're on their own. Yeah. You know, coaching, teaching is way overrated. Is that, you know, like say with somebody who's really, they're good enough to be playing the pro tour, but they, they don't have a ton of money. They're better off with a physio than a coach. I mean, they really should be their own coach. You know, coaching is... One thing, it's a relationship, and if, and you, you you think some of the people are there's the distribution of money is you know the guys at the top they're the ones with a team they have an entourage, but uh, the whole the junior tennis coaching's not allowed anyway, but what people really need is teaching, and there are there are you know a percentage of coaches that are, that are just that teaching coaches yeah where they're there I mean I think you can throw some terms out where. Like the, the superstar coaches, the celebrity coaches, they have a significant role, but they're more of a mentor and a confidant. Yeah. You know, there people shouldn't think that, um, you know, Zavera uh, hired Lendl short term. It lasted short term. And they asked Roger, the buzz is, how's that going to work? How's that going to work? And he was like, well, I don't know Lendl, but he's already three in the world. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Last, last one. Last one or two here. Um, is the Almagro return grip worth trying for a no grip change return? So Almagro, you know, extreme forehand grip, backhand grip. What are your thoughts on? Well, you can name you know, other players. Or a Berisategui, oh, something yeah. like that. that, that uh, Use the same side of the racket. Yeah. If you do something over and over again, you know, it's not 10,000 hours. It's more like 20,000 hours. Mm-hmm. But the passion, you know, the human brain is sophisticated. You can make the calculations with, um, 
I think Vandermeer has answered that so well. For the longest time in tennis, now people just talk about the forehand. Mm. But it used to be, you know, in argumentative uh, discussions, loop or straight back? Mm. You know, beginners take the racket straight back. Advanced players have a loop. Mm. But then it comes out whether you're programming the brain and you don't want to teach the kid straight back because then they got to relearn. Yeah. And actually the loop is just taking the racket head above the impact point and the ready position sets the racket up high. Yeah. And why have two systems? Yeah. The ready position, the racket's up high, you turn. turn. Why would you want to take the racket low? And there's great players like Borg, he took the racket low. And, you know, he was really more of a self taught player as well. But there's a lot of people, they hear low to high, low to high, and they take the racket low. And then back up. And back up. But with, um, why don't you read that question one more time for the old man here? Is the Almagro return grip we're trying for a no grip change return? So it's basically the no, the no, the no grip. Almagro is a Spanish player that uh, got injured in the yeah. scene with the Potro. Yeah. yeah. Low toss on say his name again? Almagro. Almagro. But Vandermeer used to say, you know, just to end the argument, what takes more time? Yeah. To change your grip or not change your grip? It takes the same amount of time. The turn. You yeah. have to be programmed to do it. That's where forehand grip, centered. Okay. Now with your left hand on the racket. Fetter's a great model. So he turns, you know, he copied Becker. Now Becker made more of an adjustment with the grip. But you turn with your left hand on your racket, so you have the option to take the racket like a volume and follow through. And you can take the left hand and slightly change it. Yeah. Where you start closing the racket face. Yeah. If you don't change the grip to be a little bit past Eastern, you just have to push your palm down. Yeah. But um no, I would just go with basics. I would I would not be a copycat. I would not be looking at YouTube clips. I would go with science. I would not be trying to like, well, the, how does this person do that? You know, when we talk about, okay, okay, let's go back to, we mentioned Jan Kodish. Let's get some film of Jan Kodish. You're going to just see old school, ready position, unit turn. And then you go to Jimmy Connors. Now, Jimmy was hitting the two-hander, but it's the same thing. Yeah. A little bit of a change where Connors had the grip a little underneath. Right, said he made the adjustment where he pulled it back in. Right. But it was like a volley with an added follow through. And he took yep. that ball early. Um, you know, I think also, too, you have to stop and think, um, you know, what surface is a child growing up on? And they better have some success early to stay connected and keep going. So if you're an American kid and you're on a hard court, you better learn to play on a hard court. But at the same time, you want to have the mentality that you're going to learn on clay court. Yeah. So you, because if you're going to be really good, um, you're going to be really good. So if American kids, it's a little sad for them is that, you know, they have clay court nationals and people think they're going to get used to the clay by hitting, you know, three or four days. They find somebody in the private court and go, yeah, I'm getting get ready for clay. Is it, you know, it takes a lot of time to get used, used <laughs> to clay. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Southern California was like, found a guy's clay court in Pasadena and practiced there for a week or two. Yeah, it's not enough, but yeah. no, I would not... Um, Tell me one more time the question again. It's no, it's basically, it's basically just thinking of a one grip game, one grip return system. But but his grip was extreme. Yeah. Um, you know that's where people will just windshield wipe it forehand. You know, don't don't change the grip. Yeah. Um, but you know you're gonna play on bad grass. You know then also too you have to realize is that you're programming the brain. Yeah. And you know the return of serve is not that much different than the volley. I think what you said too earlier is that you want to have options. So have a system that's going to give you some different options. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Last question um, on the forehand. Same shoulder turn as a forehand or less? And I think it just goes back to time, you know. If, if you've got time to take a full swing, take a full swing. If not, you're going to shorten things up. Well, that comes back to chunking. Time elapsed movie is you'll see people, for example – it looks like they have a big swing, but they have a big shoulder, big shoulder turn. Yeah. And, um, swing stays on the same side of the body. Yeah. So let's say in the forehand, the racket's not going to go past the shoulder, but they turn more and they, they're going to really use their body from the ground up yeah. I and mean, they're going to, um, they're going to lift. Yeah. Um, they're not staying down. The eyes stay down. Yeah. Like I was saying earlier with Edberg that there's some shots that, you know, I've got the film from Vic where his strings just stay facing forward the whole time. So he didn't have as much turn, but if you have time, yeah, you can really coil. With, um, yeah, there's so many things. If somebody's late, you think, well, 
Um, you know, we'll say these are late on their forehand, so you start feeding the ball slower. They're just going to move up and be late off a slower ball. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so they're programmed. They're I mean, programmed. and habits, habits, boy, you know, we have kids memorize the habit poem. Uh, it, the habit's going to make you or break you. And um, yeah. you have Stephen Covey begin with the end in mind. Yeah. And, you know, John Wooden, the fundamental doesn't change. The speed at which you have to execute the fundamental changes. Yeah. When you watch pros, they have holes in their game. But one of the things is hungry dog hunts best. They've hit more balls. Yeah. You know, and, and granted, then they're, they're okay. We, we say, okay, they're physical specimens, not always, but they're physical specimens. And they're warriors. Yeah. But you, you know, Jimmy Everett, whoever hits the most balls wins. Yeah. You um, practice. Um, if you're not practicing somewhere, someplace, someone is, and when you yeah. play that person, you will lose. You've said this in the past too. Usually the better the player, the simpler the system as well. Yeah. No, I mean, that's where. Um, Basics. You know, these podcasts is, you know, I know you are going to progress and do some more video work trying to help people with tennis teaching, but um, basically the ready position, the arm is bent, you just turn, that's it. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you have people now, well, Dominic Team does this. Actually, Dominic Team, um, he returns differently indoors. He's playing closer to the baseline. Yeah, and he, you know, he's, he he's, 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 he's simplified his forehand a little bit, but yeah. when it comes down to it, um, he's a great, great player. But, if you just think, well, if you took the return earlier, I mean, you know, like say, I, I tell people, they ask me about Nadal, I go, well, but he's from a different planet. So mm -hmm. when it comes down to um, simplicity, you know, you, you know, well, oh, the pros are way back. So yeah, but, you know, you're 11 years old, you're in the fifth grade. And why, why don't we start just working with some basics? Yeah. And, um, but Dominic team, uh, the, the tournament in London, uh, you know, he, he was just so close to the baseline. Yeah. Um, really, in the end, um, you know, he, I mean, if, if, you know, if he's going to win multiple Grand Slams. But, but again, when we talk about pros, I mean, I don't think it's a matter of saying, okay, Dominic team needs to change. But when it comes down to, um, you know, why would a young player want to copy a movement that, demands more calculation. Yeah. And we, um, you know, again, I, I told this young boy the other day, I said, well, because I want to hit the ball like Djokovic. And I said, go science, yeah. go science. When I was a kid, you know, the best hockey player in the world, maybe still the best hockey player of all time, Bobby Orr, he taped his stick a certain way and we all taped our sticks that way. Yeah. But that didn't help us with our skating. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got a lot out of this episode on the return to serve. We could go forever, I feel like, but um, hopefully you got a, good, a lot of good information and we answered some questions as well. So appreciate you sending those in. And as always, we are online, greatbasetennis.com. You can find us on social media at Great Base Tennis, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, even LinkedIn. And if you have a chance, go over to Apple. Leave us a review. We'd appreciate that. I would say this on the forehand. On the forehand side, on the return serve, on the forehand side, it's your palm. The palm to your target. The mm -hmm. backhand side, knuckles to the target. Yeah. Um, I was one time in Japan, and uh, Kazuko Suamatsu, her father, she was, became a great tennis player, um, world-class tennis player. And then um, his granddaughter, became a world-class tennis player. So he could speak a little bit of English. I couldn't speak a little Japanese. So I was doing these eight hour seminars. Hmm. So we're in Tokyo traffic and we go over to the national center. There's a big tournament and everybody knows him. He just goes like this, puts his hand like this, thumb to his chin, he goes famous face in Japan. <laughs> but I asked him, I said, uh, how'd your daughters become so good? And it was classic. He said, basics, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. And that's how you become a great returner. Yeah. Basics and repeat. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening. And we'll see you in the next one. All right. Thank you.